praise God for his word. I want to thank Eben for the music. <laughs> I, I referred to him as Adam this morning. <laughs> Praise God. But we thank God for music. It really makes a difference in our lives mm -hmm. and in the worship service. Uh, shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father, as we open your word, speak, O blessed Master. Have mercy on this feeble lump of clay and use it this one more time for your glory. I pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. It's a dangerous thing to be different from other people. The world rewards conformity and punishes those who dare to be different. I always thought it was a fine description of a Christian to be different because God calls us to stand out from the world. And that's true, of course, but don't expect the world to give you any merit badges for being different. If you want to see your name in the lights, you better learn to play the game. You got to go out along, go along to get along. Others may call you crazy or mad if you dare to walk your own road on social media. You're more likely to be called narrow-minded, bigoted, or something much worse. If you know your Bible, this will not surprise you. People said that Jesus was beside himself. Festus told the Apostle Paul his great learning was driving him insane. And in Paul's case, he did nothing more than claim that Jesus had been risen from the dead. And for that, the world declared him a madman. And we can see this principle at work, the same principle when Mary broke an expensive jar of ointment, poured it out on Jesus' feet, and disgusted by this extravagant gesture. Judas said the ointment could have been sold for 300 denarii, perhaps $45,000, and given to the poor. What a waste. Judas hated what Mary did, but Jesus loved it. Love has its reasons, and those reasons really make sense to others. So how do you explain yourself to those who question your motives? In Mary's case, she let her actions speak for herself. She never answered Judas, and often silence is the best policy when we're criticized. But sometimes we must give an answer. And at this point we come up against the conundrum posed by Proverbs 26 verse 4 and 5. Here's what it says. Don't answer a fool according to his foolishness or you'll be like him yourself. But then the same passage goes on to say, answer a fool according to his foolishness and he'll become wise in his own eyes.
So there are times when we should walk away from critics and there are times we must give an answer. And I would like to advocate to you that we need the Holy Spirit and the wise counsel of our friends to know which is which. And Paul, the Apostle Paul had had enough and he answered his critics because of the impact they had on his ministry. And that gives us the bigger picture of this section. Look another way. These two verses pierce the heart of the Christian witness. They explain why we weren't like, we are not like everyone else. The truth is, friends, we march to a different drama. We follow a different leader. We live by a different standard. Peel away the layers and you'll discover the most powerful force in the world. And the most powerful force, the greatest motivator in the world is not money, it's love. It's still love. And Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, the first part, he says, For the love, for Christ's love compels us. When critics attack, it can be hard to maintain your composure. You find out who you are when others malign your character. In the heat of the battle, it is not always a pleasant discovery. And so the question is, what motivates you? The truth is that fear of punishment often works. And that's why burglars tend to skip homes that have visible cameras. That's why you see yard signs that says, this home is protected by this security company. And that appeals to our desire to stay out of jail. Hear me, we do good because we dare not do evil. You might call this the virtue of compulsion. It makes the thief honest and the slanderer silent. It may keep a murderer from pulling the trigger. And we should not make light of this. Because the fact is that laws protect us from lawless behavior. Let me say that again. Laws protect us from lawless behavior. But the truth is that fear alone is not enough. That's why the Apostle Paul says the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ compels me. Grammatically, it could be Christ's love for us or our love for Christ. But in this context, Paul must be thinking of Christ's love for us. Because we love God, because God first loved us. Everything starts with God, and then comes down to us. Anything that depends solely on us will be weak, and feeble and uncertain. Our love waxes wane, grows hot, and then fades away. And in the light of heaven piercing the darkness of earth, let that love get hold of your heart and your life will never be the same. I chose the hymn to begin our worship service 76, written by George Madison. 
George Madison was a brilliant Scottish pastor who became one of the greatest preachers in the late 1800s. As a young man, he received the news that he was going blind and nothing could be done about it. His fiancée ended their engagement because she could not face going through life married to a blind man. His sister volunteered to assist him in his ministry and she did so for many years. But eventually she fell in love. And one day she was married and George Matheson felt that great agony of soul as he faced the prospect of being by himself for the rest of his life. And facing his grief, he wrote the hymn that remains popular to this day. He said the words came to him in just five minutes. Oh love, that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe. That in thine ocean depths. Its flow may richer, fuller be. O oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. Those words ring in perfect harmony with our text today. That's what the Apostle Paul meant when he said, The love of Christ compels us. It's a love that will not let us go. Amen. And hear me, friends, if you live long enough, you'll encounter fickle people and broken promises. Your love will be one-sided. Go one-sided. That's why we need the love of Christ. The love of Jesus is not fickle. Because it comes from God who does not change. Amen. It's the same yesterday, today, and always. Amen. That love welcomes every soul. It endures through the worst disappointments of life. I'm talking about the love of God. And the Apostle Paul says, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. So Paul says the word convinced joins the love of Christ to the doctrine that follows. And here is it. It means to pass judgment and render a verdict. When Jesus died, he died for all. There are no limitations on that statement. But notice the result. Therefore, all died. He died because in Adam, all died. And Romans 5 and verse 12 puts it this way. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone. For everyone sinned. And so we start with the historical reality. Adam sinned. The Bible traces sin back to the Garden of Eden. God told Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit from a particular tree. The serpent deceived Eve who ate the fruit and then offered some to Adam who though he was not deceived ate the fruit anyway. And through that deliberate choice sin entered the world. Before that moment, 
Adam was a living soul. After that moment, he was a dying soul. And if you had been there, all you would have seen was a man taking fruit from his wife and eating it. No lightning, no thunder, no scary music in the background. But yet from that one act of disobedience, disastrous results flowed across history. Now what does this have to do with you and me? And so the answer is when Adam sinned, you sinned with him. So did I. This is the doctrine of original sin in its plainest form. When Adam sinned, you sinned. I sinned. When Adam fell, you fell. I fell. When he died, you died. I died. And although we're not in the garden, because we're descendants of Adam, we suffer the consequences of what he did. Let me say it another way. Adam drove the bus of humanity. And when he drove the bus over the cliff, we went down with him. Or you could say it. He was at the control when the plane crashed. It doesn't matter that we were back in coach section watching a movie. When he crashed, we all went up in flames. And Paul makes the same argument in these verses in Romans 5. He says, through one man, Adam, sin entered the human race. Through one man, Jesus Christ. There is now life and hope and righteousness. Praise the Lord. Christ died for all. In some sense, this must be true. If he died for one, he died for all. That means his love reaches every person on the earth. He did not die simply. Hear me. Get this. Seventh-day Adventists. He did not die simply as a moral example of sacrifice. Let that sink. He did not die as a moral example of sacrifice. That is our example is true enough. But that does not exhaust the meaning of the cross. We can say he died to defeat death. And that is true too. But not even that comes to the heart of the matter. We will never understand the cross until we see that it was a substitution. One man died for another man. He died in my place. Died for me. His death is personal. His death is real. His death is sacrificial for all. His death is complete. He died for all. And if that's not true, if that is not true, why think of his death at all? Because the truth is, if he did not die in my place, if his death is only an example, then his death matters no more than any other death. But when we face our own sin and behold the evil within us, only then will we understand why it was necessary that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so the Bible says, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The truth is, we all want to be loved and we want to love. 
We all want to be loved and we want to love. And it's not easy to say which impulse is greater in us. But surely this is true. We were made to give and to receive love. And hear me, it is much harder to love others if we have never felt the power of love. And that's why true love is such a beautiful thing when we find it. There is nothing nobler than one person say to another, I love you. And those words uttered truthfully can melt the hardest heart. In the cross of Jesus Christ, God says to the universe, I love you. The cross stands at the center of our faith. And I know as Seventh-day Adventists, yes, we have the doctrine of the sanctuary, but even the sanctuary was laid out in the shape of a cross. Take away the cross and we have no message to share, no hope to offer, no good news to proclaim to the world. Our message is exceedingly personal. Jesus died for a vast unknown mass of humanity. He died for you. He died for me. Take away that truth and you reduce Christianity to a set of moral instructions. The gospel becomes good advice and nothing more. What I'm trying to say is that only the death of Jesus can move us to the supreme sacrifice of life. He had to be the son of God for his death to change us. He had to die to forgive us. He had to rise to save us. And Christ saves, a dead Christ saves no one. Only the empty tomb can guarantee our salvation. And so I would say, pray for the power of the cross to enter your heart. I speak as a Christian Seventh-day Adventist to other Christian Seventh-day Adventists. And notice I didn't say I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I am Christian first. Seventh-day Adventist after. Our hearts by nature are hard and cold and dark. But once the fire of Calvary touches us, those dead embers spring to life. Only a transforming love can soften the heart. And I don't know about you, but left to ourselves, we will be small and selfish and bitter and cold. Cynicism will pollute our profession of faith. We will never rid ourselves of what ails us. We need a fresh infusion of the love of Jesus Christ. Pray for that. Ask God to set you ablaze. Open your heart to the love of Christ. I have a friend who signed every message the same way. Lingering at the foot of the cross. That's where we should be every single day. Only at the foot of the cross will we grasp the love of Christ for us. Isn't that what Mrs. White says? Mrs. White says it would be well, the book Desire of Ages, it would be well to spend a thoughtful hour each day reviewing the life of Christ. From the manger to Calvary. We should take it point by point and let the imagination vividly grasp each scene, especially the closing ones of his earthly life. By thus contemplating, 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 
We talk a lot these days about meditation. There it is, contemplating his teachings and suffering and the infinite sacrifice made by him for the redemption of the race. We may strengthen our faith, quicken our love, and become more deeply imbued with the spirit which sustained our Savior. Not only that, she continues. She said, if we would be saved at last, we must all learn the lesson of penitence and faith at the foot of the cross. Christ suffered humiliation to save us from everlasting disgrace. Love changes everything. Some missionary friends wrestled with the question. People always ask them, why? Why would you leave the United States of America and travel across the world to my land? Why not stay there and make money so you can send others? Why spend your best years on the other side of the world? Why be so far from your parents and grandparents? That's not an unusual question to missionaries. And every missionary I know wrestles with those questions. And my friends added some questions of their own. They said, why take security risks? Why travel on unsafe roads? Why expose yourself to strange diseases? Why raise your children in the developing world? And the answer, focus on this text. Here is what they said. They always say, the love of Christ constrains us. To be constrained or compelled that's a wonderful thing. And friends, I thank God for the missionaries. I am standing here today because some young teenager, she was like 18 years old from in the cornfields of Nebraska. took the train down to New Jersey, boarded a ship for Kingston, Jamaica, because her fiancé was there. He was 19. Sisters and brothers, I read it in the Adventist Review. She got there. They got married. And in 10 days, her husband was dead, buried in Jamaica. Two teenagers. That young lady stayed Young widow stayed in Jamaica, Culport, all over the island. And when they left there, they raised up a church with 37 members. And that church has become the largest single denomination on the island of Jamaica. You can't go anywhere in Jamaica without meeting a Seventh-day Adventist. From Jamaica House, the Prime Minister, the Governor General, right down to what we say, arms house. Seven day Adventist. Thank God for those missionaries who came because the love of Christ compelled them. And you can read it in the back issue of the review and see her diary which was published by one of her grandson. But I thank God that she came found my mama, who was an orphan, and my daddy, who couldn't read. But they met, got married, have eight children, raised up eight of us in the church. Praise God. I am the last of eight. They couldn't read, but they would sacrifice the clothes on their back to send us all to college. I'm saying, this church, the Seventh-day Adventist has given me everything that I have, plus Jesus. 
before I do anything to hurt this church, I would walk away. This church has been wonderful to me. Thank God for those missionaries who said the love of Christ compels. And so sisters and brothers, I'm saying let the pleasures and the riches and the honors of the world be to you as dirt under your feet. Be crucified to the world and let the world be crucified unto you. Yes. Only God's love shed abroad in our hearts will enable us to treat the bright lights of the world as dirt on our feet. Perhaps the words of the familiar chorus will help us. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. This is our hope. This is our prayer. It takes just a few moments to sing those words. It's like the work of a lifetime to bring them to reality. When Christ's love fills your heart, you will find joy in the darkest moments. Your faith will rise above your fear and the living for Christ will be a blessing and not a burden. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Yes. Do you understand and believe that when Jesus died, he died for you? You had a place in his heart when he hung on that cross. Jesus didn't just die for a vast, unnamed mass of humanity. He died for you. And he died for me. And when that love fills your heart, you will gladly live for him. Friends, the songwriter says love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. The love of God is still the greatest motivator in the world. And if you've never been in love, if you've lived long enough and you've never been in love, I pray to God that you will find love. Because love will make you go home. I remember when I was in high school and the first young lady I spoke to, and I felt that thrill. I went home, I didn't want to eat dinner that evening. <laughs> I told the guys that we boarded, I said, you could have my dinner. I couldn't wait for the next morning to see her. Love will make you do strange and foolish things. But it's love. The love of God. May God gave all of heaven in one gift. Friends, I tell you, I don't understand it. I can't wrap my mind around it. I said, God, what is it about me? That you would do all of this for me. But the foolish love, when you love, when you find love, and love, thank God, for the youth ministry of the church. Friends, I want to say thanks for camp. Because I went to college and all the girls that I like, Pastor Luther, they would say, oh, Kenny, we like you, but I can't be married to a pastor. I said, God, what's going on? Left college, didn't have a girlfriend to marry to. And you know, I was in the ministry and I had like 14 churches. So you're doing three, four churches on a Sabbath. 
And I was under a fig tree, the birds over my head, and I'm eating my lunch in my car. I said, God, I'm lonely. But thank God. Amen. I went to camp and I saw that lady, and I thought she was somebody else's. But praise God, she said, I don't care too much about the ministry either. But if that's what God calls you to do, I'll support you. Amen. I said, yes! <laughs> praise God. God will provide. Amen. Do not dismay. Whatever be tied, God will provide. Trust him when you can't trace him. Friends, I will tell you, I was baptized when I was nine years old. And God has been good to me. If you trust God and God fail you, you come and tell me I will never call his name again. Father, thank you for the greatest love that you love us, that you died for us. Thank you that our salvation is guaranteed by an empty tomb. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is poured out as a deposit. God, on layaway, and we know that you're coming back for us. I pray that today everyone in my hearing my voice, Lord, will hear you saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you to me. As we go from this place, we ask that you will be with us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.